All right, so welcome to Find Your Green Job in Brussels, part two. Here we go. Um, if you, can you give me, can you show your hand if you came to the part one session, just so I know who was here before. Yeah, I recognize some faces and some not, perfect. Um, what I've done is, because it was a longer session, I did just a half an hour walkthrough of the slides um, and it's on YouTube and this is the name of it. So you can find it and review what we did last time without having to sit through the whole thing that we did last time. Um, but what we covered in the last one is basically, what is a green job? Why would you want one? How to kind of find something that's in line with your values, also identifying what your values are. Um, how to apply for a green job and um, we talked a lot about spontaneous applications and I very much recommend spontaneous applications. Um, what should be in your application and also how to find a job um, online because a lot of jobs are not advertised and so if you haven't seen that then that might be useful to you. So today's session we couldn't cover all the questions that came up in the last session and so I wanted this time to be a much more sort of free-flowing um, Q&A session. I'm not here holding myself out as a teacher, as a shiny guru who knows everything. Um, I have been in Brussels for 20 years working mostly in environmental and sustainability um, fields. So I've got a lot of experience of hiring people, of training people, but there will be things where I don't know the answer, but I just, I want to make this space available for us to share um, and I hope that some, I've got something that can be helpful to you. So just a little bit about me, if you don't know me, because there were some new people on the list. Um, I'm basically a sustainability communications consultant, and I also have a coaching and mentoring practice, which this work is part of. Um, I'm the founder of Sustainability Consult, which, we, which I set up in 2008, uh, and we've been hosting Green Drinks Brussels since um, 2012, 13. Um, and then, yeah, the coaching practice is also helping people to, to find their way and to find their way to a more meaningful career. And the reason for doing this session, or this series of sessions, is because I know how hard it is already to find your way through the maze that is recruitment. Um, and I think that the lockdown has made it harder. So there are a lot of people that I was talking to having individual conversations, people struggling to you know, find their way and I thought let's just put something together. So I hope that it can be helpful. And we're gonna have loads of time for questions and interaction. Like it's not gonna be me talking the whole time. Um, my approach to this, as I said, I come out of almost 20 years of sustainability work, environmental sustainability, but I'm also very much um, formed by my mindfulness practice um, and a nature connection practice so you know finding it really important to be in touch with nature and I've done some studies around that and also looked very deeply into you know resilience and eco grief and burnout and compassion fatigue and all of that we talked a bit about that in part one so if you're interested you can go back and see that and I wanted to share with you something that I've uh, started doing now because we're coming out of the corona lockdown in June 2020. Um, and you know, it's a little uncertain whether people are going back to the office, what the rules are. People have coped differently with lockdown. I mean, we can all look at one picture or one situation and we'll all see something differently, but for us, that's our reality. And so the Leaving Lockdown workshop is to get teams together to really talk about what they've been going through, how they've been getting on and what their fears are around coming back to work. So if you are in a job or in a team or in a group already, and that's something that might be helpful, it's basically a facilitated conversation with you know, advice and insights thrown in. So you're very welcome to um, ask any questions that you want. I've gathered the questions from the previous session. Um, I've got them here on the screen and don't feel you have to share, but please feel that you're very welcome to share. If it's just me talking, it's not going to be very interesting. So these are some of the questions that came out the last time. I'll, I'll run through the questions and then I'll start to dig into the questions and then I'll invite you also to share your thoughts on the questions. So this is some of the things that people were asking. Which organisations have green jobs? And this was specifically about Brussels because the session that we did in part one 
it was about Brussels, but there was also a lot of general advice about how to find a, a job and how to find a green job or a meaningful job. And so people wanted a bit more specific information about Brussels and like, what's the difference between different types of organizations? Because, you know, we use all these terms, NGO, consultancy, institutions. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. A very specific question about what type of job titles should we search for. So if you're actually doing keyword searches for specific jobs, um, you know, what type of things should you be looking for? And, and fundamentally, is Brussels a good place to find a green job? I just want to put a bit of context around this before we start to dig into the questions. So when we as expats and as policy people talk about Brussels, we usually mean the EU Brussels bubble. When you talk to a Belgian person uh, and they talk about Brussels, they do not mean the EU bubble very often. I live in Flanders and the amount of times I've had conversations where I was talking about Brussels and the Flemish were talking about Brussels and it was not the same Brussels. So um, I just wanted to bring that up here. So we say Brussels, we mean the EU policy bubble of Brussels. We don't mean the real world Brussels, the real Brussels, the real Belgium. Uh, and there are lots of brilliant things going on in Belgium. I've lived here for 20 years, I've become Belgian, uh, but it's not what we're talking about in this workshop. However, I do want to give you just a little bit of an idea of the types of jobs because of this question about what sort of job titles should you be searching for, the type of jobs that exist in the real world, not in Brussels. So this applies to Belgium, but it will apply if you're an expat here, it will apply to any country, to your home country, to any other country you might look at. It's a huge long list. I'm not going to go through them all. You'll get the slides. But it depends on your definition of a green job. Right, if a green job to you is something to do with natural resources, climate change, um, land use, you know, recycling, waste management, energy efficiency, green buildings, all of this, this is a huge field. Now, most of these jobs you don't find in Brussels, in that policy bubble, but you might find them in real Brussels. And so I just want to offer that because it's part of the frame around the whole question of Brussels and green jobs. Okay. If anybody wants to unmute themselves as of now and jump in at any moment, you are more than welcome. You can ask me for a follow up question. You can ask me for clarification if you don't understand something. I don't want anyone to be sitting there thinking, what is she talking about? Um, so please feel free to unmute yourselves when you want to ask a question and just jump in. You don't have to ask permission. You can literally just jump in, pretend that we're in a room <laughs> together, not a Zoom room together. So. Firstly, we have the EU institutions, which I think is what Brussels is most known for. And that's the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council. You've also got the Committee of the Regions and, you know, other sort of attached um, organisations. And I don't actually know that much about how you get a job in one of those because I've never done it. I've always been in the private sector. But I mean, there are there is a concours to get uh, really a job of, um, you know, a full time official in the Commission. There are also some possibilities for short term contracts and many people in Brussels start off doing a stage, doing an internship in the institutions. And that's very helpful for their CV and it's what I've seen in 20 years, it's super helpful for the people that they meet along the way. So that is one thing maybe to consider if you're very interested in policy. Whoops. And that's really you no. Know, Certainly in the home countries, as it were, when people think about Brussels, that's often what they think about, right? The blue flag and the stars and the big buildings and the you know, TV presenter outside the council. And, and then we have public affairs consultancies, which you might also you know, call lobbying or lobbyists or advocacy. And the word advocacy tends to be used more in the US, but it is starting to creep into, into Europe. Um, and public affairs consultancies or public affairs offices they are there to lobby the institutions. They're there to try to influence the institutions on behalf of a client. So it's consultancy, but it's really trying to change or influence policy. It's trying to represent a certain sector or company towards the institutions with a goal um, of making policy change. And you'll see that some of the bigger companies also have an EU office. So that's something you can search for online if there's a company you're interested in. Do they have an EU? policy office and then apply directly there. 
the trade associations, I haven't specifically put that, but the trade associations are another group which represent a whole sector. And so the companies uh, will be represented in the trade association and then sometimes it's the trade association that lobbies towards the uh, institutions rather than all of the companies going you know, individually, which is not very efficient. Um, and what often happens is the trade association will do it, but then when they need a really hard hitting you know, issue to be dealt with, they'll send the CEO or a very senior C-suite person from one of the member companies to go put some pressure on and say, you know, if you put this legislation in, it's going to cost us however many jobs and the company's going to relocate to another region and so on. Um, so that's public affairs or lobbying. And this is really basic, but people ask me for this. So if you're thinking, I know all of this, just stick with me, we'll get past this. But I want to cover the basis for the people that are not comfortable yet with this language. Because I think Brussels, you know, it is like anywhere, it's a bubble and we have our own language, we have our own terminology. You also have law firms here, and they're quite similar in many ways to public affairs consultancies, but if you have a law degree, you might look going, at going to a law firm. Now, a lot of it's competition law, which is a huge thing in Europe, um, but sometimes they will also do lobbying, and you might find some junior jobs um, you know, um, in a law firm or in a public affairs consultancy. Uh, the media, which is where I started, started as a journalist on environment and energy, and before that, finance. Um, quite hard to get into, but I mean, if you're interested in doing internships and things, it might be, you know, also interesting. Um, and then closely related to the media is communications. Communications is a big field in Brussels. It's what we do at Sustainability Consult. Um, the lobbyists that are going to the institutions, they want to get a message across. And in my experience, policy people are not always the best at communicating a message. So they need help from the communications people. And so some um, consultancies in Brussels will be public affairs and communications, or you might see public affairs, public relations, you know, PA, PR. Um, the communicators are there to take a very complicated message. And I've worked in the past with lobbyists who there'll be piles of paper all around the desk, all around the floor. And I'm like, that's the policy people over there because they've literally got to get their hands into all these different pieces of legislation and look for inconsistencies and all of this. The communications people then take that and break it down and disseminate it into something which is more understandable. Um, and also then using tools like press releases or briefing journalists, breakfast briefings, this kind of thing, or, you know, we do a brochure or a website or an event, you know, different communications tools to get the message across. There's not a lot in Brussels specifically on sustainability communications. It's why we started 12 years ago, but it was one of the questions that came up before. Um, a lot of the lobbying firms or the PAPR firms will work on environment and energy because those are big files in Brussels, but it doesn't mean that the communications they do will be done with that subtlety, with that understanding of the issues. And that's actually why, you know, there are people like us who do very specialized stakeholder sensitive communications around sustainability, environment, energy, and so on. And then the last one um, is EU projects. Now there are quite a few companies in Brussels that exist just to do EU projects. EU projects is uh, things like research projects, science projects, uh, regional development, or they might manage events like Green Week or Sustainable Energy Week. And those are big project management jobs. And they include um, communications jobs, but they'll also include, you know, events management, project management, whatever. Um, it's quite a complicated landscape, but I just want to offer this so that you can do your own research and find something that's interesting to you if you're drawn to doing EU projects work. Um, it's quite hard to give an example because it is so diverse, but we, we've worked on a couple of EU projects over time as the communications partner. And so a company like like that, who is a communications partner or any other kind of partner on a project, they might need some support. Um, and that might be a way in to doing a kind of green environmental work in Brussels. I have to talk about NGOs, of course, because they are a huge and a very important part of the landscape in Brussels. I tried to break it down, but there are so many, you'll easily find them by doing a web search. I've broken it down by area of activity. 
and these are still the European focused ones. Now, some of them are European offices of global NGOs like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, people that everyone has basically heard of, WWF. Some of them are very specialized to Brussels. So I'll run through quickly. So on climate, we have CAN Europe, which is a Climate Action Network Europe. There are others, and these are just examples. Environment, you've got the big ones that everybody knows, but they have European policy offices. So if you're Googling and you're looking to send a spontaneous application, don't Google WWF Belgium, Greenpeace Belgium. You need Greenpeace European Policy Office, EPO, or WWF European Policy Office. There's a big distinction because obviously they're present in Belgium as well, but they're not generally doing EU work from the Belgian office, not generally. Nature and biodiversity, people like bird life, they've been very um, vocal on biofuels campaigns, for example. So it's not just about, I like birds, I'm gonna go work for bird life, I wanna protect the birds. No, it's about protecting habitats. It's about opposing legislation, which they feel is threatening to biodiversity and bird habitats, this kind of thing. Transport, there's a really good NGO in Brussels called Transport and Environment. And they, I mean, when I was a journalist, I used to take them very seriously. You know, they were, yeah, they were just an intelligent NGO, basically, on transport and environment issues. Um, then it depends how broadly you see sustainability. I think, you know, democracy and human rights, to me, that's part of sustainability as well. And so then we've got people like Amnesty or Save the Children or um, Plan and then healthcare has a really close relationship to environment and to sustainability. And they've got things like um, healthcare without harm. I'm not sure that they're based in Brussels actually, but they are active in Brussels. Um, and then Health and Environment Alliance HEAL is another great one. So this does give you an idea of the type of organizations. Then the search terms question. If you are literally going to sit down and Google and try to find a job, these are some of the search terms that you might look for. Now, I couldn't put every single variation, we would have been here for pages and pages, but you know, environment officer, environment project manager, environment policy officer, environment intern, you know, you can add all of those phrases to all of these search terms. But here we've got everything, food and water and other resources, probably not human resources, although if you want to do sustainability, that sometimes is, is done out of the human resources department, though not usually in Brussels. Um, sustainability, sustainable SDGs, for example. CSR and corporate responsibility, you see that a bit less in Brussels, that is more uh, in the world of the real world jobs, but you might sometimes find it. Um, yeah, energy, carbon, climate. I want to take a quick break there and just ask if there are any questions that come up already because I've covered quite a lot quite quickly. Don't want to spend the whole time on the slides, but does anyone have something they'd like to ask or get a clarification on? Just unmute yourself and jump in. We have time. And if not, I'll keep going. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Save your questions then. So have I answered which organizations have green jobs? What's the difference between these different players? Or do you want to dig into that a bit more? Are there any specific questions around that? All right, you're an easy crowd tonight. <laughs> and the types of jobs- I might have a question if I may. Of course, please, welcome. Um, is it like when you start at one specific type of those uh, possibilities, is it hard to switch to other ones or, or like, uh, because now I'm interested in doing maybe an internship for like an institution, but maybe in the long term, I would like to work for an NGO. Is it seen as a, a valuable um, asset by working in different institutions or, or NGOs or do they really like if you start an NGO that you end up in an NGO? No, it's actually seen as beneficial because the idea at least is that you understand how that world works and they are different. You know, they work differently, the language is different. So um, if you did an internship in the institutions, I think that would be well regarded anywhere because that shows that you've got your basics, that you understand how the legislative process works. A lot of people in Brussels still don't. Um, 
if you like I was a journalist I was an environment journalist and then I got hired to go to a consultancy that was mostly doing communications and PR and they saw it as a huge asset to have an environment journalist on the staff um, equally if you had been at an NGO and then you went to work in a consultancy they would find that very interesting as well because you'd know how it works you'd know a little bit more about like the, the the strategies and the tactics and what might be expected maybe you'd understand also the landscape different NGOs doing things in different ways and so on so yeah I think like get as much and as broad experience as you can actually okay thank you you're welcome okay so I think I've answered those and then I want to have a quick discussion about this which means at some point you have to unmute yourselves and speak um, because they've got the question is Brussels a good place to find a green job and I think it's a really tricky question. I think if you want to do policy or policy related, if you want to change how things happen in the environment, in industry, part of that change has to come through policy. So if you want to be in that, then Brussels is a good place. But is Brussels a good place in general to find a green job? Maybe in real Brussels, but I'm not convinced actually that the Brussels bubble is a, the best place to find a green job unless you're really policy focused. But I'd love to hear from you guys. So I'm going to sit here until somebody would like to jump in. What's your experience been? Don't be shy. The little microphone button on the bottom, you just press it and then you can speak. If not, I'm going to have to throw to Barbara and say, help me out here, my colleague. <laughs> but I would like to hear from the group, honestly. Is Brussels a good place? Have you come to Brussels looking for a green job and found one? Or have you come to Brussels and found it to be really difficult to find one to get started? Or you happen to be in Brussels because you're Belgian or your family is here and you're not sure if you should stay here or if you should, uh, you know, move to somewhere else. Mariana, hello. Hi. Um, hi everyone. Um, well, I think, yeah, it's a tough question. I think it is a good place because there's so many opportunities and there's a lot of stuff going on um, about sustainability and so forth. But also, I mean, it depends how you think about of a green job. Because yeah. I find sometimes like I can get a bit disconnected with the real world and it indeed feels like such a bubble. So, because also for me, a green job is something where I find it meaningful and I have a connection to the issues I'm working with. So I find that in Brussels, there might, I don't know, I, I find that sometimes you can feel maybe a bit cynical or a bit like uh, disconnected. So, yeah, it depends, it depends how you, yeah, and how you... Disconnected from, from the real world, you mean? Yeah, in a way that... Um, maybe it's sometimes hard. I mean, it depends. I work more in the communications. So mm. That's more like my, my area. And there, at least in my previous job, it was about um, human rights. I felt it was difficult to understand what's the real impact of my work because it was indeed such a policy level and, and change so slow. So, for example, when you mentioned that, okay, so a green job could be, I don't know, like a, a forest guide. I guess yes. there you might be more connected to the actual issue you're working with so i just feel that sometimes it can be a bit abstract as well um, yeah. but of course it depends what kind of person you are and, and what you take the job about um, but i i do think that that there are for sure a lot of opportunities but also there's a lot of competition we can which can also make <laughs> things seem a bit i don't know um cynical sometimes there's a lot of competition for positions yeah I think if you're not really passionate about policy, then it's maybe not the right place. You know, I think there's a, there's a natural attraction here to come and make a difference on policy, come and make change. But if you're not motivated by policy and you want to do sustainable business or ecotourism, or you want to set up a zero waste startup or go learn about composting or something, I actually don't think that the Brussels bubble is the right place. And I do wonder, because there's so many people, and it, it's really painful for me to see that there are so many people struggling in Brussels to get on that ladder. And I hope that this can provide a bit of direction on actually whether this is the right ladder for you to be trying to get on. Um, of course, some people are here because they're from here or, or they have family here, but it doesn't have to be 
a Brussels bubble job necessarily. There is, as Mariana said, you know, a lot of competition for that. All right. So anything else on that? Um, I, we've got some people that have worked here for quite some time. Anything you guys would like to share? Just unmute yourselves if you'd like to say anything. I think we're all melting a bit in this heat. <laughs> Madhu, you've worked in a trade association for a long time. Did, can I be cheeky and call on you? Yeah, I was... Uh keeping quiet because it was definitely not a green job. It was for the plastics industry, so. Yeah, but you, I mean, it was for the plastics yeah. industry, but you have experience with communicating environmental messages because even the plastics industry communicates. Yeah, the last few years was all about sustainability and so on, but it, it, to be very honest, uh, it was just what I was trying to uh, sell for the institution, uh, but it was a lot of greenwashing, so. And that's a big risk, right, with, uh, yeah. with green communications. It is the greenwashing. That's why we, I set up my firm, you know, in the beginning, because it was, there was so much greenwashing. And some of it's not even intentional. It's just uninformed. So, yeah, there's a big piece around credibility. I think if you're really, you know, if, if you're really passionate about the issues um, and then you have to go work for an industry that doesn't match your values, then you might feel yourself getting dragged into a greenwashing situation does that resonate for you Madhu? yeah it does but then you know uh, if i look at the other people on the uh, panel tonight what i see they're all much younger than me and when you're a little older the choices are somewhat limited and that's quite interesting let me stop you there because i think there's youngsters on this panel who think that it's really hard for them because they're young and they don't have experience and so it's actually interesting to hear that other perspective of actually when you are a bit older would you like to say something about that? Yeah, well, what I was trying to say was that when you're older, your choices are limited. When you're younger, you, you can be idealistic and you can be uh, anything that you want to be. I mean, I've had younger colleagues, um, uh, pretty much as young as the people here tonight, and uh, they could actually walk away from the jobs. Yeah. Uh, while we older types had to hang on simply because our options were limited on the outside. You have more responsibilities. Yeah, so there was no point being ideological. And I, even though I was greenwashing, um, Mariana mentioned earlier that she was in communications. I was in communications as well. Um, but yeah, I, I had no choice. I had to sit there and take it. Uh, it was either doing what I was asked to do and continuing to hope for a better option somewhere else, or uh, yeah, they would show you the door. Mm. And, and, and that was the uh, case for me. So that's not to discourage anybody, it's just my personal experience because I'm older than you guys. So. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Maybe one of the younger people on the call, we already heard from Yoma, but I mean, Heather, you, you talked to us last time about you know, being straight out of university. I think you said you did sustainable business qualifications. Does Brussels feel like the right place to have landed for you? Um... I, it feels like as good a place as any. I, I must admit that I'm I'm looking in Brussels, but at the like real world side because um, um, the the EU bubble seems like yeah, effectively other than policy, there are not um, thousands of sustainability related jobs, and the ones that are available have got a lot of, of competition. And I found that even applying for internships in policy related areas that I get turned away because I don't have any experience or any knowledge about policy at all. So I can't even do an internship to get experience in that area or to, to, to learn about it. So, um, yeah, it's it's really complicated. Yeah, and you're in, in the internships game, you're up against people with, you know, a master's from the College of Europe or whatever, who know everything about every amendment that was ever made or so they'd like you to think. Um, and it probably, you know, if you're interested in sustainable business, it might not be interesting for you anyway. So no, you're looking more not. at real world Belgium, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. And how is that going? It's, it's also really complicated. Um, I mean, the coronavirus hasn't helped, um, but I, um, yeah, I think it's really hard to find a, a first, uh, like a junior position um, in business sustainability because people, companies are either looking for people with experience or 
or possibly for interns if you're lucky but then the internships are really interesting and everybody wants to to do um, the internships so there's yeah. more, like, a lot of competition for it as well yeah it's challenging yeah. um yeah, yeah that's interesting anybody else uh, care to jump in on this is brussels a good place to find a green job how are you finding oh, yeah that? i was gonna say that exactly Hi. before before my day spoke hello um i think it depends on what stage of your career you're at because yeah on the last green jobs webinar i spoke about how difficult it was when i had a bit of experience but not enough experience for the five years experience you need for a, a lot of junior positions um so yeah it really depends I think where you are in your career and where you're willing to go and what sacrifices you're willing to make. You know, I mentioned that I had to do five internships before moving into um, a more long-term job. And in the end, that actually worked out quite well because I gained different levels of experience in those. And it was really positive to have experience in lots of different areas. And again, going back to the NGO question as well. Um, so yeah, Madhu, I was also surprised to hear that you're saying that older people are a bit more limited uh, because yeah, my experience like, like is similar to Heather's and it's the opposite. And I think as we're going to head into a recession, uh, I think that this is an issue that's going to come up again. Do you all feel that your chances are worse now with the lockdown and the, you know, yeah, I'm seeing lots of, yeah. So I want to share another perspective on that because to a certain point, people, people will always need to hire companies and organizations will always need to hire and there's i've seen a few people now that have started a new job during the lockdown and i just did the leaving lockdown workshop with a team and they had uh, several people who had joined either just before the lockdown or even part way through the lockdown so i don't want you to think that like your chances are really limited there are hiring is still happening you know people still move on people still leave change jobs there's always going to be a certain amount of turnover um, but I hope that this helps to address a little bit the question of, of Brussels, because I think if you're not from Belgium um, and if you're from a, an EU country or a formerly EU country, in my case, um, you've grown up with this idea of Brussels, like this is, you know, for me, the idea of like, oh, yeah, I would go and work for the European Parliament or something, which I never did, actually. Uh, but it was very appealing and you had to sit exams at the end of university it was all very structured you know it was one of those places that you wanted to go to are you only going to go to the to the un or to the to geneva or to brussels they were like these big centers but those of us that have been here for a while and know how it works like you, you start to see that it's not necessarily all that um does anybody want to ask anything else about is brussels a good place or share an experience that they might have had about finding or not finding a job in Brussels? Um, I was, I'm, I feel like I'm in a bit of a, like an in-between kind of halfway house where I was here five years ago um, at the Carrie Leuven doing uh, European studies okay. um, and then changing my idea, like, you know, go to do European studies and go and work in the parliament. Mm. Um, and then I left, decided actually, no, I don't want to do that, moved to Italy for five years. And now I'm back again and without that kind of European experience. And so if I'm looking for entry level positions, they want me fresh out of my European studies. Yeah. Uh, and does, and does, the, does the time that you spent in Italy and the work experience that you have there, do, do you feel that that counts for something here? I think it does. I think it's, um, it's difficult because I was working as, a, as an English teacher and then working in tourism. Um, and then, so, you know, you gain a lot of skills doing that, working, being independent, being a freelancer, um, but not necessarily in the kind of directions that I would like to move in now. Um, so it's, mm. it's, it's a, I feel a bit in, kind of in between. So I don't know whether it's better to be in a position where you're fresh out of university, probably going into these kind of things, especially with internships, I don't know. Um, I think it, it will also, also have the expectations, right? Yeah, I mean, I was fully in the expectation of doing internships um, to try and get some experience. But then it's, I see these internships where they want experience already for their internship, or you have to be either in university or fresh out of university. You have so, to be okay to not get paid in a lot of internships in Brussels, which is also totally wrong. Uh, yeah, exactly. But so that's my, my experience. Okay. So, what's your position now? You're looking for something. Yeah, still, still looking. Um, 
I mean, my my plan was to kind of come here and then survive on tourism and then tourism is oh, gone. Yeah. <laughs> while I looked, but yeah. So mm. it's a, a bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it's tricky. Things are coming back online, but yeah, it's not going to be the same as it was before for a little while, if ever. All right, thank you for all your experiences. It makes it so much richer when we can hear from people. So someone asked as well, what can you do other than internships to get started? And we also had a question last time about how many internships should you do? Well, you heard from Barbara that she did eight, uh, five, but that was in Brussels and London. Um, what else can you do? Like, what else have you guys tried to do other than just getting internships in order to get experience? What have you been doing? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, uh, sorry I'm a bit late. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, my name is Lily. Actually, I was not, I'm not in Brussels right now. I'm in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a sustainability master. And I'm from Taiwan, from Asia. And this whole thing is I'm staying here for almost two years and trying to do green job. So my intention to attend this workshop. So I want to share for this question is that I also did like freelancing for like just to get experience and to know how the big NGO works in the Europe. So I mean, um, I'm definitely with visa issues, but if people that you are European and you don't need to worry about visa, it's definitely good to do uh, freelancing. So did you do an internship as a freelancer or did you do those? I did both. Okay. Yeah. And you did an internship then in the Netherlands, but in an environmental? Yeah. So um, internship I did in a small NGO. They do um, sustainability reporting, the carbon emission reporting for logistic industry. And my freelancing is to do as a research assistant for a bigger NGO called Global Reporting Initiative. Yeah, I've worked for them, I know them. Uh, GRI, so yeah. they're very big in uh, sustainability reporting. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And how do you, what challenges do you face now for, you know, your next steps? Yeah, my next step is definitely um, a visa problem. Mm -hmm. I prefer to stay in Netherlands, but Brussels is uh, having a lot of opportunities. I have a lot of friends from my program that is uh, working in Brussels for Green Job right now. So yeah, I know Brussels is definitely with a lot of opportunity, but as a non-European, it's visa is a hard problem. Yeah, it's more but, challenging. Huh? Yeah, it's very challenging. For, for me now, I have to look for um, green job or green related job in big businesses. Mm. companies and so they can provide me visa and until the years that I can apply for um, permanent residentship then that's a chance for me to work freely here <laughs> yeah yeah because the bigger companies they've got the HR department and they've got the, the habit so they have yeah, resource, I guess, of, yeah. of getting visas for people yeah it's totally. interesting that you touched on freelance because that came up last time <clears throat> and Joshua, you've mentioned a bit about freelancing as well. Um, is that something that you guys would consider doing if you can't get, if you can't get, you know, the next step job? Would you consider freelancing? Because I wanted to see if there was an interest in that because we could maybe do another session on it. So it came up last time as well. Um, I'd kind of be interested in that, but I... Um, I, w I have absolutely no idea how to go about it and I wouldn't think that I have enough experience to be able to do freelancing. And you have um, to be able to sell your services. Yeah, so, yeah. There's also the mess of Belgium being, oh, yeah. Belgium and being a freelancer. It's just an absolute nightmare. <laughs> I've found, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. But I used to have a business with a eight nine people on the staff and that's even worse like having now scaled it back to being a much more sort of low key almost freelance operation with just barbara and myself it's like so much easier than trying to run a team and social security uh, and that is a actually an interesting um element of brussels right the belgian tax system is horrendous it's very expensive to hire people 
it's one of the reasons why there are so many internships because companies or organizations, they don't want to commit to like a proper employment contract before they've tried you out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's maybe something to consider, but I think we could talk about that another time because I do think there's a lot of different elements to freelancing. And if you're the right kind of, you know, character to be able to freelance, if you're organized enough and all of that, but I'll definitely keep it in mind for another topic. It was already on the radar after the last one. Um, if I can just uh, button yeah, for a couple of minutes. Um, I'm currently on unemployment. Um, okay, since I, my last job went to the corona, at the start of the corona thing. Um, and what happens is uh, I need to go to counseling with the VDRB yeah. um, for my unemployment. And uh, the, we had a session uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, they have the internal analysts, and this is what they had to say. Um, regular employment, as we have known it all these years, are projected to end. Yeah, um, I agree. They, 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 they don't see that happening anytime now, or next year, or even 2022. Um, so what they, think, what they think is, because the, the, the virus is going to come back and they expect the second wave after the uh, summer and, and all that stuff. Basically, there's going to be a lot of flux in the job market as such. So what they're saying, and that includes all the stuff that you just said now about how horrendous it is to go to a labor contract and employ people and then fire people and so on. What is projected now is going to be that, that companies will look for short term uh, hires. Which means whether we like it or not, I think for a lot of us, for many of us, the future looks like we're going to have to freelance. Yeah, or it's like freelancing or kind of pseudo freelancing, because maybe they'll hire on a sort of contract, which is like a proper contract. Yeah. Um, or maybe they'll just look for contractors who are freelancers. Yeah. I think we've been seeing that coming for quite a while. And if you look at the US especially, not that you know, there's anything positive to be said about the social system or the healthcare system there. But if you look at it because of those costs, the freelance economy is much stronger. Um, and they call it the gig economy. You know, you go yeah. work a gig here, work a gig there. It's, it's a different way of seeing things. And I mean, we're also working with more freelancers now, having gone from having a big team to now just being the two of us. And so it's definitely, I mean, it's definitely interesting. You know, if you, whatever skills you've got, even if you're, you know, early careers, um, there's a need for that, right? There's a need for that and people don't always want to commit to or can't afford to commit to a full-on you know, employment contract. Um, so thanks, Madhu, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, and something else about uh, internships because I think some of them are looking for internships. Um, at uh, Plastic Europe, where I was uh, there for 10 years, um, we saw the first interns walking by about 2014 or so um, with no real role to play. Um, and at that time, I remember when I joined in 2009, um, we were 42 people, no interns. By 2014, we had the first intern walk in. And uh, by the time I left Pask Shirov in December 2018, we were 32 people, out of which 10 were interns. Wow. So that's, that's, that's going up like crazy. That's also basically because the organizations are trying to cut costs. Interns are not paid very much. Um, and now, over the last two years, what I've seen is it's not just the Brussels-based associations which are taking on interns. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to have spread into the private sector too. Um, mm -hmm. I have friends who have startups in uh, Ghent and in uh, Leuven and so. They're all hiring interns, which I find bizarre in the private sector. Yeah. But that's an easy way of getting out of uh, expensive hires. So. Yeah, and it's an easy way for you know early careers people yeah. to, to get experience. Yeah. Um, someone asked last time, you know, how many how many internships is too many, and whether it became if you reach a point where it becomes sort of a negative thing to have so many internships on your profile. And I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't actually. I don't think so. Uh, you know, there was this uh, Romanian guy who was my colleague at Plus Sheriff. And uh, when he joined up Plus Shiro for his internship, he was already on his fourth year of internships. Wow. Yeah. So and we were kind of trying to advise him, um, uh, to, to telling him that it doesn't look good on his CV if you're going to keep adding up stuff. I know Barbara said something about her internships. She but, did uh, five, but then she landed with us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this guy, too, I, I just recently looked on LinkedIn and he's a director in some company. 
<laughs> and, and that's amazing. In the in three years' time, he's gone from intern to a director. After four I'm years of intern, the last uh, fifteen years. So it's mm, interesting. Basically, it. I think. Uh, anything is possible absolutely we also had stories about like having the oldest interns ever because we had some people coming to us through um erasmus program or erasmus plus um which is for slightly older people to give them you know an opportunity so yeah we, we had some of the oldest interns ever who yeah some of them actually stayed with us um what else can you do apart from internships we've mentioned internships we've mentioned freelancing what well, else I, I I wanted to come in quickly um, to yeah to answer answer on the internship thing. Yes, I think five five felt like too many, but none of them were longer than five months was the thing. So I never I never felt like I was getting stuck in that rut, and that's where youth definitely played a part. Of I could then you know jump to jump to something else, and on on freelancing. So I'm a fairly new freelancer. I've only been doing full time freelancing since last July. And actually, the way I started it was by doing part time freelancing. So I was working for sustainability consult five days a week. And then I wanted to scale back to four days a week. And I really thought I was going to stick to those four days a week. But then this opportunity came up to do some comm support for a, a startup one day a week. And that was a really nice transition into freelancing where, you know, I still had the security of a, of a job contract um but then something else as well and uh you know it was nice to have the the extra cash from not doing the extra day in sustainability consult and i think that's something that i really didn't know about actually until i was approached by by the the startup looking for that support um and you know if if there's a way that you can talk to the company where you're working at right now to yeah to maybe reduce your hours and start your freelancing that way i think that's that's a much nicer way and you have a bit more of a safety net knowing that you have, if you have a, a business you know, a contract with a company and you can do freelancing on the side, it's a, it was, for me, it was a very nice transition into full-time freelancing and gave me the confidence to go into full-time freelancing as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like in Belgium, there are contracts, like you, you can be indépendant complémentaire or um, in, in Beberup in Dutch. So there's like, there's the facility in the Belgian tax system to have a freelancing operation on the side or, to have some additional income on the side. I mean, it can be, you can paint houses. It doesn't matter what you do, but like it is possible to have a job and then to earn extra money and then to pay taxes on the extra money. It's far better to, to, to be freelancer that way, to have a part-time job on the side of your freelancing for the Belgian tax system than having all of your income for freelancing. Oh, yeah. so, so definitely if you already have a job in Belgium when you want to be mm. freelancer. Yeah, or maybe it like, makes you more able to take something that's perhaps not the perfect job, but, but you take something so you have a bit of stability and then you build up the freelance practice on the side maybe. Yeah, and that's kind of what Barbara is saying, like she's transitioned out of being a full-time employee with us to being a freelancer for us and then for other people along the way as well. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting one. What else can you do? Internships? Uh, potentially freelancing what else can you do to get some experience especially if you're at the beginning of your career um, so it's not something I've done yet but it's something I'm considering because I'm in the same position as Heather so I'm currently finishing my degree in sustainable management uh, and I'm looking for a job and I've seen that more in real Brussels um, it's really difficult because either they're looking more for uh, engineers who can actually do like hands-on more green projects uh, or they're looking for people with a lot of experience like i found sustainability consulting job or sustainability advisory and it's always have at least five years experience already in consultancy or in sustainability and so right now i'm considering just getting a non-green job a more traditional one either in consulting or, or something like that to acquire this experience and skill and then try to make the shift later on. But I'm really afraid of like what Madhu said earlier, like getting stuck then, you know, mm -hmm. being stuck in, in, in industry or in a company. And, you know, in five years, maybe my, my current knowledge about sustainability could become completely obsolete. And I don't know if I'd be able to, you know, keep it up to date by myself. I don't know how I do that. So mm -hmm. I really don't know if that will work out or not. It doesn't sound like you feel that's a good idea when I hear you talking about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm half convinced and half not. Uh, in part, I think it might be a good idea because, I mean, consulting interests me just in general. 
And I think it can teach you a lot, like, mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of, of skills and in terms of knowledge. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm naturally anxious about the future just in general. So um, I mean, if I try to be optimistic, I'm like, yeah, sustainability is going to be more and more important. So of course there are going to be jobs and then you'll have the experience. But then the negative part is like, well, <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know. But I'm also, you know, pressed for time because I I can't afford to do an unpaid internship. I have to have a job to be able to, you know, sustain myself mm-hmm. uh, in September. And so I'm really running out of time. And yeah, Corona hasn't helped with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing stopping you applying for both. Mm-hmm. True. And it's true that consultancy is very particular. Like I, I was in another consultancy before I set up Sustainability Consult and I learned a lot. I mean, it wasn't all sustainability work. That's why I felt I wanted to set up something new. But I did learn a lot. It's another language. It's a way of handling clients. It's a way of reporting your time. It's a way of being, you know, super precise. Like my quality standards are through the roof. And that comes from journalism and consulting. And Barbara's going. (laughs) But I mean, it it is good practice. Um, Consultancies are looking for paid interns. Mm. I didn't know that. Yeah. (laughs) But what we said in the previous session, you know, you've got to do spontaneous applications. If you want something now for September, Brussels tends to shut down a lot over the summer. That doesn't mean that there's no hiring going on. So people tend to panic and think that's it. There's no chance of getting anything. That's, that's not the case. But um, you need to be proactive in you know, June, early July. Yeah. There was something else I was thinking of when I asked the question, and that was volunteering. So as a way to get experience on your CV, okay, an unpaid internship is practically volunteering. But then I think if you're going to spend your time for free, um, perhaps choose where you spend it. You know, are there volunteering opportunities? Doesn't have to be full time, but things that you can get on your CV. And I probably sound like, you know, somebody's mom right now going, oh, you've got to fill out your CV with good experience. That's not, that's not my intention, but if you're really stuck and you can't do anything, you haven't got anything, there comes a point when it's not good to stay home anymore, that it's not good to search jobs, you know, day and night, you know, online, trying to send off CVs, you just lose the will to live. So um, at that point, I think that volunteering can also be really helpful. And before that stage, ideally, um, I think if you send an application to an NGO or to any kind of grassroots organization looking for some work experience, looking to volunteer, they're going to be quite open to that. And you say what you can do because any kind of NGO or grassroots organization, I mean, okay, they have to take time to explain it to you and to, to, to train you. It's not, it's not that there's no input on their side, but most of those organizations are very strapped for cash. And so even if you say, can I come two days a week? You know, I don't mind what I do. I just want to get experience. I just, I believe in your, because because I want to say like, where is the passion? Like if you are really motivated by something and really driven to do something, there's a drive, there's a passion to do that. And then you can always reach out to organizations and just offer some time or maybe they have a big event coming up and they need an extra pair of hands or maybe your English mother tongue and you can offer to review you know, conference materials or, you know, any written materials, whatever. There's so many opportunities. I've been volunteering for quite a few years now with the Naturpunt in Flanders, which is like the nature conservation group here. And it started out because we were sponsoring. So we're members of, as sustainability consultant, members of 1% for the planet. And so we give 1% of our turnover each year since 2012 to um, local Belgium nature groups and it's usually not open through that I started volunteering through that I also met my partner moved to Flanders and that's a whole other story for another evening probably face to face um but you know there there are opportunities and I mean it does when you haven't got much on your CV yet it's it's good to put those things on as well then what skills do you need for a green job like people were asking is there something special and I want to just cast back to that long list that I made of what could be seen as a green job. I'm not convinced that there are specific skills that you need, because if you think about it, a green job can be a normal job, but in a sector which is trying to do things better. 
I don't think that there's a little cloud, a little green cloud with all the lovely little green jobs and we're all so happy and drinking from our water bottles and we have to get real also about the state of the economy. But there are jobs in a whole range of sectors which you could consider as a green job. So I don't really think you need to have very specific skills. However, I will say you need to be passionate about the issues. You need to be knowledgeable about the issues. So if somebody would um, approach uh, me for an internship, which right now we're not taking interns, but in the past, and I still get a lot of applications, um, and they haven't got any, any sort of visible way of showing that they're into sustainability or environment, like that they know about it and they get it. And even if they haven't studied it, but that they're passionate about it, and I can see from their activities and I can see from their volunteering and from their cover letter, that they're passionate about it. That for me would be enough to have a conversation. So I don't think it's specific skills. I don't think you need to understand how to write a GRI report or the latest you know, technology developments in FinFilm Solar, unless you're going for a job in FinFilm Solar, right? But just having a passion and an understanding of the issues What's interesting for us with the communications background is it's a sensitivity to stakeholder concerns and that's very important in Brussels. A lot of the lobbying work, a lot of the comms work, a lot of the institutions work has to take into account or should take into account um, stakeholder concerns. Stakeholder outreach, stakeholder engagement, that's a whole job in itself. So if you can demonstrate that you understand the issues, you know what the concerns are. For me that's already a lot. I don't think that there's like a specific, you need these top five things to get a job uh, in sustainability. Anybody want to add or ask anything about that? I, I definitely want to add to that and, uh, and relate it a bit back to the volunteering because, um, I mean, I talked about before how I got my job at the sustainability consult through being on Twitter and Catherine was following me on Twitter and I think one of the reasons that she was, correct me if I'm wrong Catherine, was because I went through this period of unemployment where I was volunteering. I was volunteering at an ecological park near my, near my place uh, and I, I mean I did it because it was, it was near where I lived but I, I did it kind of with a view of if I can't have a sustainability job right now and I don't have you know sustainability degree you know I did I did psychology and then kind of transitioned into sustainability it was definitely a good way to show that I had other kind of skills and passion um, that, that wasn't you know di directly linked to the job that I was not in at the moment um, so yeah I, I would definitely back you Catherine on, on the volunteering I lost my little bar with the mute button on. I was like, you'll have to keep going, Barbara, because I can't speak anymore. Um, no, totally. And I mean, we've always seen with you, Barbara, that it was interesting that you had all this different experience, you know, and, and that's where the internships and the volunteering is useful. Like your most question at the beginning, is it is it a problem if I do this and then I do that? No, do it, do it all, do whatever interests you, do what you can get, like you've got to get started somewhere. And it might not be ideal, you know, you see those diagrams where it's like, oh, what people think your career looks like. And it's actually like this huge, like insane squiggly mess. Yeah, that's just, that's life, isn't it? Um, so I, I think that applies more generally to, jo to job hunting as well. Like, you know, the advice that I was given is, you know, if you have a CV, how can you make yourself stand out? Uh, you know, if, if you've got the same degree as everyone else, like what is it that you're going to bring that's unique? And volunteering and you know showcasing your interests and, and stuff like that is definitely a way to to make yourself stand out and then uh, and then yeah start those conversations like you and I did Catherine. <laughs> exactly she stalked me and I gave in <laughs> and it's been wonderful. <laughs> um, anything else on, around that because I mean that was quite quite important questions they were quite important questions that I received I thought has anyone done, you know, volunteering or internships or unpaid internships? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. I, hello. I, I have um, some things to say about that. Uh, so first, uh, hello everybody. I'm Ornella Perotti. Um, currently, I'm also finishing a degree in corporate sustainability. I think it's the same than Alice because I recognize her a bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I am currently doing a volunteer experience. Actually, um, it's not directly related to a green job but 
in my in, in my case it is because I am currently helping a small company that is making kombucha to make it um, for greener and to help it, help help him sorry because he's struggling because of the coronavirus because people are not uh, buying anymore in uh, vrac as we say in French yeah in large quantities. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we are. I am currently helping him as a strategy uh, consultant. That's great. I love kombucha. Oh, I've lost you. It will help me, but on the other side, I am also very um, afraid for the future because in the same case as Alice, I am currently searching for a job for September, and in my case, I have another issue: is that I do not speak. Dutch fluently and in Brussels Dutch is a must requirement even no, though I it doesn't matter it doesn't matter I know you think okay. it matters and people tell you that it matters but it doesn't it depends what kind of organization you go to so there's the Brussels bubble which we talked about at the beginning of this which is the EU policy world and there there's people that don't even speak French there you know, so for, for that world, you really don't need Dutch. I speak Dutch now, but only because I live in Flanders. Um, so you actually don't always need Dutch because I really hear people worrying a lot about that. What you can do and what a lot of French speaking uh, Belgians do is um, summer school. So I did summer school at Kau Leuven and I believe that they also offer that in Brussels and it's a one month intensive. It will kick your butt like nothing else, but it, is actually quite helpful. Like my Dutch improved a lot after doing that. Um, so at least you can show on paper that you have some Dutch. Um, but like, do you need Dutch now for the kombucha business? No, I do not. Hopefully, because it is uh, actually not a business from Brussels. It is from Namur in Wallonia. Yeah. So uh, I do not I do not need it. But this is a short term project, and it will soon be be over. And uh, uh, I am quite stuck because I am searching for jobs in Brussels, but also in Wallonia and yeah. for a green job. And it's really difficult because I've also the feeling that it's also about um, word of mouth. Yeah. And that uh, when you do not really know people that are in that sector, then you, especially when you are a junior, when you just graduate, it's even more difficult. Yeah. And what's the situation like in Wallonia? Because I actually don't know that much about the landscape there for green jobs. Because if people are not fixed on Brussels policy bubble, they might also be interested in, in looking for something in, in Wallonia. What is that like? Um, I would say that in Wallonia, uh, it's quite small businesses. Yeah. Uh, there, there is no big corporations such as in Brussels. Uh, I think there are big steps taken for sustainability regarding maybe the public sector, yeah. but uh, there's no few, in my opinion, there's only a few opportunities and uh, it's really difficult because there, there are basically less jobs than in Brussels in Wallonia, so. Yeah, it feels like there's more of the actual real businesses, like the businesses trying to do sustainable products or, you know, like we said before, zero waste, eco-tourism, but just things that are trying to help people move to a more sustainable lifestyle. They, they're not in the Brussels bubble, they might be in like real Brussels, but definitely, you know, in Wallonia and in Flanders, you're going to have options around that. That's true. Uh, for instance, you have a lot of uh, small companies making uh, organic uh, skincare products, yeah. or whatever, but often it is small businesses. And when you apply, they're like, we would be really happy to have you, but we managed to keep ourselves in our own company. So we can't afford you. Basically, so you, you, we could do internships, but um, that's maybe a personal uh, opinion, but uh, I do not see myself making uh, uh, internships for one, two, three years. Uh, at some point, I really want to have also uh, some valuation for my work, because as you said in Belgium, most of internships are not remunerated. And personally, I value my time. And I have the feeling that if I always do only internships, Somehow people would think that I do not value my work. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I'm actually happy to hear that because there's so much of this um, internship after internship and, and people not being valued. At the same time, you need to get some experience. And so if you would do like one or two internships, that, that would not be the end of the world. What, what bothers me with it is how undemocratic it all is because 
as long as you can afford to work for free, like you can go stay with your parents or your parents can pay you or you've got income from somewhere else, you can do it. But it does create, um, it does reinforce even further these distinctions between people who can get on and people who can't get on. And, and it's just another symbol of our privilege. So you've got to do what you've got to do to get on the track. But when you're in the position of hiring interns, I hope that you'll think about what you went through. And, also help people to get on the ladder i mean most internships aren't paid a lot but they should be paid something you know okay um anybody else want to come in on any of these points so far does it give you something to think about is it interesting you're still here so i would hope so <laughs> what about the i don't know any any comments on different situations like we talked about Wallonia we've touched a little bit on Flanders I should say for Flanders like Ghent is really big for any kind of environmental things but then you would need to speak Dutch um okay I will move on oops I'm like super sensitive keypad here how do you find a job when work has gone remote is this something that you're worried about it was something that came up in the feedback just give me a show of hands if you're worried about how to find a job now when everything's gone remote. Yeah, a bit, yeah, okay. Well, as I said earlier, like some people are being hired, you know, there are still jobs, but of course it makes it more complicated. And I think what I saw during the Leaving Lockdown um, workshop, and I'm continuing to do those, is it's harder to bond with your teammates when you've never met them face to face, right? So people are finding new ways of working online. Like I work online mostly, so for me it's not a problem. And we've always had clients like all over the world, like on five continents. So we didn't sit down with them very often and sometimes we didn't sit down with them at all. So I'm quite used to it. But I know for other people, it's really a, a challenge to not be able to get together face to face. Are you seeing jobs being posted still? I mean, has there been a, a slowing down in the adverts for jobs? Um, for me, in fact, I've been surprised um, that there are a lot of job offers. So I'm looking for comms jobs in NGOs. And I was concerned because of the coronavirus, but now there have been so many job postings that I've even been busy <laughs> applying. Um, but one thing, though, that has been quite challenging is that I had a couple of interviews, and the first interview I had, and then it's been like, a, like you know, it's a, such a specific situation. It's been a while since I had my previous one. So it's anyways like a very, yeah, nerve wracking situation. And then it was um, online. So this was quite something um, that was hard to pre prepare for because I couldn't make this kind of first impression. And then somehow, at least for me, what happens is that if I don't know, if I meet people for the first time online, it's maybe more difficult to somehow bond or, or connect. So that was just something to, I don't know, to, to think about and be prepared that the dynamic is somehow, yeah, it, it's different. Um, but in fact, for me, there have been a lot of jobs and that's been, yeah, a positive surprise. Anyone else? Um, for me, I'd say it's been kind of weird because in the beginning of the lockdown, it felt like everything shut down. So I was in various recruitment processes at different companies and they all said okay no we're putting everything on pause during lockdown and it seems that it's still on pause because i've sent emails now and i'm not getting answers <laughs> uh but then i'm i'm starting to see just just this past couple of days that job offers are starting to come in again uh at least for for young graduates i'm, I'm seeing uh more general jobs start to come in again and I would hope that sustainably jobs would, would come in even more because people have, you know, the crisis has made them understand how important sustainability is. Um, but um, I'm really not sure about that. No, I think if you're going for interviews for jobs that are not clearly defined as sustainability, that's a really important point that you can make and you can show that you've done your studies in sustainability and you understand it. And this period that we've just gone through has mm -hmm. shown more than ever that we need to be more sustainable and that businesses need to be more sustainable and, and we need to be more resilient as a system. 
in terms of you know making the first impression um, when you have an interview don't forget it's just equally weird for the person on the other side yeah. you know you think like oh they're super comfortable and slick and I feel really awkward everybody's in the same boat and we're all just humans and I feel like actually it might be a bit easier in a way because you haven't got all the stress of like having to go to the office and what you're going to wear and, and you really get there on time and it's, it's a bit more manageable to do an online interview so I feel like you know with a bit of practice that's that's probably not so bad hopefully yeah yeah I think you know like like Catherine I'm used to having clients who I don't see very often if at all um and it's it's been very interesting and I think Catherine you would agree right how everyone's like oh you know what what is the zoom how does it work when, <laughs> when we've been using it for years and years um so I think it is going to become something that is more normal, uh, despite kind of the shortcomings. But I, I would say as well that, um, you know, I these kind of events and any kind of courses that you can do where you can network, that is absolutely something that you should be doing in lockdown if you if you are looking for a job. So um, I was doing the Ellen MacArthur Circular Economy course. Uh, I did it because to kind of you know, try and top up my knowledge of circular economy. But to be honest, I did it because I, you know, I saw that there were thousands and thousands of people uh, who were on it. Um, and just from asking a few questions in the Zoom chat, that led to people connecting with me on LinkedIn being like, oh, you know, that question was really interesting. You know, I work in plastics, for example, uh, can connect. Um, and that course was especially good because they had a Slack channel where you could introduce yourself and I could literally go through the thousands of people who'd introduce themselves and connect with people, you know, in sustainability, people in Brussels, uh, fellow Portuguese speakers and, and things like that. Um, and that, that's, you know, it's, it's time that you have to spend doing that. But I, I think that's just as helpful as applying for jobs, because as mentioned in the last, uh, <laughs> in the last uh, session, I, this year was the first year that I got a job by applying for it. Every single other job and client I got, I got through contacts. And that's okay. really important to, to try and do, it, especially I think as what well, I mentioned, you know, it, you know, it can be a very closed world. It, it can be very much about the people you know. The positive of coronavirus is that people are moving to network more online. It is more acceptable to kind of message someone on LinkedIn or, or write them an email and you should take that opportunity. And it's more introvert friendly as well. Like if you get stressed by going out and having to sign yourself up and it's all quite fake. So I feel like connecting online is a lot more real and you can just be yourself. Um, again, privileged speaking, right? I have my studio, I have my nice space where I can take calls and things. And I know that not everybody's built their life in that way. I mean, I closed our office last year so that I could just work from home. So it was important for me to have a space, but people are much more forgiving and much more understanding. Like if you're in your kitchen, that's not a big deal. Like people get it. And so to me, it feels like things have become a lot more human. This shift to, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, like the shift to online to me feels more human um, because it feels less fake, even though there's like the screen in front of us and it's for the brain, it's not quite the same as being actually in the room with somebody. And it can be quite tiring because of that, because our brain is a little bit confused. It's like, I see you and I hear you, but I don't feel you. And there's a little bit of a delay and that causes our brain to be kind of a bit confused and, and whether it can trust it or not. And I think that's, that's what I've read is why, you know, we find it so draining to be all the time on Zoom. But if we can see it as an opportunity and, and as Barbara said, this is how things are going to be for quite some time. And so if you're actually starting out in this world, you've got an advantage over some older people who really are struggling. Like, I've been on a lot of calls with Zoom where people are like playing around with the backgrounds and stuff and, and oh, I've merged with a tree. It's like, this is a meeting. <laughs> so it's, you've got an advantage if you can get used to these tools and get comfortable with these tools quickly. Are there any more questions? If they're big questions, it might be that we carry them over for another time, but is there something that you came hoping to hear or to better understand and you haven't quite got that feeling for it yet? Like, is there something else you need that I can help you with? And as I think I said at the beginning, I meant to say at the beginning, I'm not here as like the shiny guru teacher, but I do just want to share, you know, the 20 years of experience of doing this. And I know how critical it is at the moment when you're trying to find a job. And so for me, the, the goal of this is really just to help share any insights that I might have that can help you. So don't hold back with your questions if you have any. 
Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I would like to talk about and um, during this crisis time, it's definitely like when you are looking for a job and you went for interview, and there is anxiety that you don't know if they will close this position immediately because of the crisis reason that, you know, there's so many unpredictable factors now in the economy. Um, yeah, so that is also my struggle now because I'm actively applying to different jobs and they took, I feel that they are taking longer time to process all the applications. Mm. Maybe for remote, what everyone working remoting or... Yeah. Yeah, so... That might well be the case. I, I don't know, but that might well be the case. But then it's really a question of how can you handle insecurity? You know, how can you keep going and keep applying and, and just stay, faith, you know, keep the faith basically that you will find something and you will get your visa for your next job. Um, yeah, definitely. And keeping, yeah. keeping going and reaching out, like, like we've said, also reaching out on LinkedIn. Um, I mean, I feel mm. like there's a whole conversation around how to get yourself noticed on LinkedIn and it's fairly straightforward actually, or on Twitter, you know, whichever is your poison of choice. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of insecurity. I definitely see that. And I know that's really hard to, to get through, but you just have to hang in there, I think. And just keep, just keep doing it. Just like, you know, what's really, what's really important. It's the whole thing about the power of why it's like when you have emotional engagement in something. So when you know why you're doing it, when you have a strong sense of why you're doing it and it's because you're passionate and you believe in it that will help you get through the insecurity. If you're doing it because you're like, I want a job in sustainability because it's going to look nice on my CV or because it sounds good to my friends at home or, or whatever, then that's, there's not mm -hmm. enough motivation to get you through. But when that motivation is really driven by wanting to be part of a better world, then it sounds perhaps a little bit idealistic. And I know that going through uncertainty is really, really hard. But that, that will yeah. help you to stay the course. Yeah, because that is the, the tricky things I found here. Like, as everyone reflected, you actually see there are still job posters on the website, on LinkedIn, everywhere. But the thing is, you are actually also not sure if they are keeping this position, these positions. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so they might advertise for something <laughs> and then in the end not hire for it. Yeah. I guess it depends if they really need the person or not. Yeah, totally. For, um, for the Brussels community. Sorry, go on. I, no, I just want to share this with everyone. Like, it's my experience right now. Yeah, thank you. I've, um, when I do see interesting jobs that are somewhat environmental in Brussels, I share them on the Green Drinks Brussels Facebook group, and I posted a couple today. Um, so if you're in Brussels or you're looking for work in Brussels and you're not on that group, jump on there. I'll accept your, you know, request mm -hmm. to join. And then I keep trying to share things there when I see them. And, and there were actually a couple of uh, interesting things today that I shared. Thank you. I'll keep an eye on that. Thanks. Yeah, keep an eye on that. I want everyone on there. So <laughs> when, when there's a good internship, there's like 50 people from Green Drinks Brussels applying. <laughs> then they get all the quality candidates. <laughs> Uh, and I always say to companies in Brussels, like, when you have jobs, let me know and I'll put them on the group. So I'm trying to also strengthen that, that link. But yeah, I, I hear you on the insecurity. It's, it's tough for everyone. Also for us as, you know, freelancers and own business, it's, it's also been tough. We've also lost work and there's also a lot of insecurity. I think it's, it's everywhere right now. But I think, yeah, by coming together as a community, we can also help, help ourselves, like, stay strong and stay the course. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely nice to hear from like so many people that is actually in the same situation. <laughs> Good. Hello. It helps, huh? It helps knowing that yeah, you're not it, alone. It definitely in the, helps. Yeah. In the struggle. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Would anyone else like to jump in? I was just wondering if you could uh, facilitate, since this is your show, something like a Google Sheet or something like that where people can contribute. I mean, all of us are like-minded here. We're all looking for uh, opportunities and we're not likely to see all opportunities that are out there. If you could facilitate something like a Google spreadsheet that everybody can contribute to and probably list volunteering opportunities, jobs themselves, 
uh, things in the sustainable world. I think uh, uh, since, since you're coordinating this, maybe you're in the best position to do that. Um, that would probably become very handy. I know, uh, I, I saw the stuff that you posted today the, uh, in the Green Rings uh, thing, um, but that was completely by chance. It just happened to be on my newsfeed and I saw it, uh, uh, you know, but we should have a constant way of going back somewhere to be able to uh, uh, see it and your best place to facilitate. Uh, that's something that you can think of, uh, Catherine. Yeah, I should think about that. I should start a green recruitment agency. I mean, I do try to use the Facebook group as the best place for putting things, but what, what else would you be looking for apart from like job listings? What would be well, in that? You know, the, 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 my takeaway this evening is, uh, I, I didn't consider it, but uh, I, at my age as well, I would uh, actually considering, uh, consider volunteering. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was actually a fantastic suggestion. I mean, you know, I have so much time on my hands right now. Oh, wow. I have very little things to do. Uh, it would be absolutely uh, perfect uh, to, to keep myself, uh, you know, occupied. At this stage of my life, the money doesn't matter. Uh, it's more a thing of being creatively occupied or there's a lot of things that I can do remotely without having to leave home. But at least at the end of the day, there's a satisfaction of having done something substantial or yeah. uh, what? In, in, in the green world uh, where we could think that we've changed the world a bit. Yeah, that you can uh, use your skills for good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. so, so if those kind of listings could come up, for instance. Now I, okay, from today, I will start looking for volunteer op opportunities. Um, but then, uh, you know, you, you're, you're more likely than anybody else to actually come yeah. across these. But what's really good is that I know that you're open to that now because people do contact me. So that's also where I can come in as a kind of go-between or a facilitator or a coach or whatever. So if I know that you're open, um, then I know to pass things through to you. So that's also, you know, a really good part of the community. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me think about how we can still build on this because I wanted to do the session tonight, see what the questions were like, see what the interest was like, you know, if there were other burning questions or other themes where we might need to have another call or, you know, there are different formats. So I definitely, definitely take that on board. Thank you. And I already have one idea for you, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> any, any more? I'm really here uh, to help, so just, don't just hold back. Tip, uh, you, you may know about this uh, thing. There, there's a company in, there's an association in Brussels called Amphory. Um, it used to be called the Foreign Trade Association, but they've now rebranded themselves into a Sustainable Trade Association for Sustainable Businesses. Oh, wow, you couldn't say sustainable enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and they have a lot of, lot of jobs going right now. So that's okay. for all of you um, who, who are looking for it. Uh, it it's uh, spelled A-M-F-O-R-I. A-M-F-O. A-M-F-O-R-I. A-M-F-O-R-I. Oh, yeah. So Amphory. Amphory, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Amphory, they have a lot of sustainable jobs. Oh, great. Sustainable Trade Association. So those of you who are specialized in that area, I, I think that's something that you can check out. Yeah, great. That sounds great. I'll take a look as well and put it onto Green, the Green yep. Drinks Brussels group. Yama, you were looking to jump in. Yeah. Um, so I, I forgot to introduce myself the last time. Um, I'm Yoma. Um, I'm from Leuven and I'm just graduating as a bioscience engineer. So like really the environmental part of sustainability. And now I'm looking for an internship or uh, volunteering, it actually doesn't matter, uh, for just three months, like September until November. Um, but I'm just wondering at how demanding I can be, because I don't want to be um, like doing some, some paper stuff. I don't mm -hmm. want to do an administrative job. I really would like to participate already on some project or something, but I don't know if that's like something I can already demand. That's especially, such a good question. Yeah, especially when doing like... Um, applications, um, um, for, um, yeah, how, how did you call it? Spontaneous, um, spontaneous applications. applications. Yeah, yeah, that's the word. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really difficult question because a lot of internships, they do hire interns to do the work that no one else has time to do. Yeah. So it can be a lot of paperwork and databases and if you're lucky, signing people in at events or something. I mean, we've had interns do those things as well over the years. It's, it's kind of the role. I think if you are looking 
if you're open to an unpaid internship, does that maybe give you a bit more leverage to say you want to work on projects? I think you can always say it. You might find they agree and when you get in there, it might be slightly different, but why not? Why not set out what you're looking for? And I mean, you're, you said you're a bioengineer. Yeah. There's a lot going on in Belgium in the biotech space. I mean, we've worked a lot in the biotech space. I mean, for sure, you should be able to find something around. Yeah, but it's more like the, the landscape management part and, and forestry part. So it's not really that big. Oh, in, nice. In, in, yeah. In, so it's like Iron Bay, Bus, Bus Plus and all of these kind of organizations. Yeah, yeah. But then I'm, I'm looking more for like the, the international NGOs and stuff. Okay, um, WWF has a big uh, forests um, department and also in WWF Belgium. Yeah, but they have a clear internship program which you need to oh, apply okay. for. And I also only have three months, so most of the programs that I've seen were for six months. But well, I already I would, have an internship, so I wouldn't in let that stop you from applying, even if it looks like they have an existing thing, but you're a little bit outside of that. Apply anyway. It just takes you a little bit of time and you never know what it leads to. And yeah, why not be a bit demanding, Barbara? Yeah, um, I, I would say if you know the time frame that you have, it's probably better than to reach out to people working in the organizations that you want with, with that in mind saying, you know, hi, I really want to work for your organization, but I only have these three months. Do you have anything? Rather than spending your time applying for, for positions that you, you know, you, you couldn't do or, you know, you might have to negotiate for. And I would also say, uh, you know, many, many times, I mean, I'm sure maybe others in, in this chat would agree. I've had to manage interns where they say like, oh yeah, yeah, well, I'm happy to do the admin. And then they're not happy to do the admin. And that is very frustrating. Um, I think, you know, I always try kind of when, when I'm managing people to be like, you know, look, you know, if you have to do the admin, you know, maybe you can help me with this or that, that's, that's projects. Um, but just bear in mind that that does happen. And if you say that you're happy to do the admin and then you're not, then that can cause issues between you and, and the person who's managing you. Um, so I, I would agree with Catherine that it's better to be demanding and say up front that actually you, you're not keen uh, because then they, they people know what they're dealing with. I mean, I understand why people say that because, you know, I had, I think I said last time I had like a four month unemployment spell. By that point, I was ready to do all the admin in the world. Um, but, you know, if, if there is a job opportunity and what you want to do doesn't match it, then you're going to run into issues. So, uh, so yeah, I would say it's good to be demanding. I would say for everyone, like the clearer you can be, the better it is. You do yourself a favor. You do the person you're working for a favor. If your application email very clearly says, these are my skills. This is what I'm looking for. This is the time period. It doesn't need to be paid or it can be paid, but it doesn't need to be paid. Like very, very clear. Then you've set your boundaries and they like it. Great. They don't fine, but you're not all going to waste a whole load of time and energy and aggravation trying to squeeze you into something that you're not happy with. Like let's, let's own our stuff and say what it is we're looking for. And if you don't get it, you'll get it somewhere else. You're not going to be stuck doing databases in the corner for three months. Does that help? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Of course. We're coming to the end of the time, but if anyone else has a question, like I still love you to jump in. Heather. Sorry. I have a quick question. Um, I never really know what I can um, do for a company, even in an internship. So I have tried to say, well, I can do this, this and this you but I don't really know actually because I've never worked in really in uh, such an environment so I don't know what I can yeah and that's where you need to do an internship to figure out what it is yeah yeah and actually to do whatever they offer you and that's where you'll learn what you like and what you don't like because mm -hmm. if you really yeah. don't know because you haven't got any experience um you, you're gonna have to get some experience and figure it out like and as part of my university, I did internships. I did a year because I studied languages in the UK. And so I did a year, half in France and half in Germany. And they were work placements. Mm -hmm. And I was really keen that they would be work placements and not university exchange because I knew like I could already get a bit of experience. And then like summer jobs, I could get a bit of experience. And so I was already sort of getting a picture of what I was interested in. Sometimes you've just probably got to do your time and go do that job and be like, oh, I really liked the HR part of it, but I really hated the you know, some other marketing or whatever part of it. 
yeah. yeah. I mean, you can say what your skills are, you can say what you've studied. Mm -hmm. But it's true that at the beginning of your career, you don't really know. And when I look back more than 20 years to you know, me and my friends that graduated university in, gosh, 1998, um, most of us are not doing anything to do with what we studied. It's also the reality. Like my best friend from school did zoology and has worked in comms for years. You know, it's, <laughs> I did languages and I, it helped me go abroad, but that was about it. You know, so... And Barbara did psychology, which is very useful, actually, when we look at behavioural change. But, you know, most of us are not doing what we studied. And you might find, you know, you study sustainable business, but you go and get into the marketing department or something and you find it really interesting. And then you go with that. You know. yeah. I do see the degree as a stepping stone. It's helpful if you have one, but it doesn't have to set the course of your life forever. Mm. Yeah. It's maybe bit strange to think about now but you might look back on it and be like oh yeah it was really good that I did that sustainable business degree I mean everything if we want to have a more sustainable world everything has to become more sustainable so even if you like Alice said before even if you would do a normal job the fact that you bring with you all this depth of knowledge on sustainability is going to be helpful and we need that if we want to make change we really need that anyone else and I'll, if not I'll just quickly wrap up so this is one of the things I want to leave you with. We have to believe in better. We have to believe in change and that we can be part of the change because otherwise just we can all just give up now. The planet is burning. Like we're just going to accept that, you know, biodiversity is getting wiped out. The planet is burning. We won't be on the planet all that much longer in the grand scheme of things. I'm not so worried about people, but I am much more worried about biodiversity and the planet. And so I think, you, you can't lose that feeling of wanting to be part of the change. And I hear that in all of you, when everyone's spoken tonight, I hear that in you, that you do believe in doing things better. And so that's a sort of guiding principle for me and I wanted to share it. Um, it would be great if we could stay in touch. So, um, you know, there's the Green Drinks Facebook group. You're also welcome to connect to me directly on Facebook. Um, I'm offering personalized support as well for people that need it. So coaching and mentoring, reviewing CVs and this kind of thing. And um, yeah, we'll see, you know, if there's more interest in doing more discussions, but definitely we'll have still the Green Drinks Facebook page where you can, um, you know, keep up to date on what's going on and keep in touch with the community. So that's me, that's how to contact me. Um, I'd be very happy to hear from any of you on Facebook or by email or whatever. I hope that the series is helpful. Um, so we might come with some more things depending on the need. So if there's something that you'd like me to cover, just let me know, send me a message, send me an email. Um, maybe something more about freelancing or maybe something more about comms. Um, just let me know what the need is and we'll try and do it. So that's it. Thanks very much for joining. Um, thanks to anyone who has watched the video afterwards. And um, it's lovely to see everyone. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.